Hey, what's up, guys? This is part two of how does a computer work. You have to watch part one or else none of this is going to make sense. All right, so just starting off this video and um, let's go back to our basic premise of what a computer is. All right, think of your computer only practically useful with an OS as just a set of processes getting scheduled to do whatever you want with a limited set of resources. All right, so that's the basic premise of what a computer was. We made the hardware connection here. We talked about what a CPU does, how the OS tells the CPU what to do, and how well the CPU does it. All right, so that was the hardware connection. And now we're going to talk more in terms of software and what the operating system is doing. All right, so hopefully you guys have grasped how the CPU is connected in all of this. And now let's just talk about what the OS is doing to get all these processes scheduled and executed. So scheduling, let's talk about scheduling first. At any one specific point in time, you're gonna have hundreds, hundreds of processes running on your computer. Any computer is gonna have tons of stuff running on it. It could have stuff running on it from the system, like the computer has its own processes running. On one computer, you have processes running on that computer. If your friend logs into that computer from a remote location, he or she could also have their own processes running on that computer. You could have a lot of things running, all right? So a process, again, a process is literally uh, anything. It's literally anything. It's the small script you're running to crawl the web. It's the crazy video game you're playing. It's Chrome and YouTube as you watch this video. It's a background kernel process doing whatever they need to do. So everything, everything is a process from the perspective of the operating system. So for the rest of this video, we're really going to put this kind of, be in this kind of mindset. Like think of everything in terms of a process. So for scheduling, the process needs to get executed, right? To even function. The CPU needs to execute the process and it's the OS's job to schedule all the active processes to get their fair share of time on the processor. So this is essentially, this is the essence of scheduling, and we can't get into the super details of how scheduling works. It gets pretty crazy, but it's like the OS pretty much tells the processor, okay, let's spend some cycles on process A. Okay, let's switch over to process B. We need to spend some cycles over there. Okay, let's go back to process A. Okay, process A is done. Let's switch to process C. All right, so tons of scheduling going on by the OS for hundreds of processes running on your computer. All right, that's the main essence of scheduling. So the other thing to remember is why do things break? All right, we're all used to like our computers crashing, you got a blue screen of death, something froze. So like why does stuff break? And this caught me up over a long period of time, but like, you know, things always break. You do control alt delete, you swipe up on your iPhone, you do Android task killer. What you're essentially doing when you, you force quit all these applications is you're killing the processes, right? Processes can F up and then you got to end them. You got to forcefully quit out of them. So why do these things break? It's like, why do these things break and why do computers crash? Like when I was growing up, I was so upset when my computer crashed and I didn't understand why it was crashing. So pretty much processes break because of software problems all right it's always a software problem like because inherently software created that process so if that process misbehaves there's a problem in the software computers and hardware are not built to crash all right they only crash because the software running on them destroys stuff this is a really important point all right so i'll say it again computers and hardware are not built to crash they only crash because software on them just messes up so processes can break for a variety of reasons. Um, it could be misusing resources, like if a process is using way too much memory in the computer, it could just end up not working. If it just uses way too much RAM, it could be a straight up software bug. You could have written a software bug that just is not good, right? You could have written an infinite loop and your program is stalling. We could have, shit, we access the bad part of memory. It could just be a straight up software bug and another thing, remember, there's limited resources, so other processes might be messing up. So some other process is using all the RAM 
and now our process is screwed, all right? And this happens sometimes too to cause breakage. Always remember there's limited resources in the computer, right? You only have so much RAM. Um, and in the rare case, this is a rare case that I just wanted to put out there, but that the software that controls hardware can also have bugs, right? If the software controlling your hardware messes up or Fs up, then your physical hardware could be misbehaving, and that's when you really have to restart your computer. All right, so again, think of your computer as just a set of processes getting scheduled by the OS to do whatever you want with a limited set of resources. So one thing that's just crazy, if you take a step back and think about what's happening here, it's really a little bit of magic, right? How is all this stuff working together? And I just like to call it operating system magic. All right, and we just let's just sit here and like realize and appreciate everything it's doing. So, for example, if one process goes down, it's usually fine. Your operating system is not going to explode or go down, right? If your video game stalls out, you usually just force quit the game and restart it, and it doesn't. Get, it's not going to break your whole computer, right? If you're using Microsoft Word. My Microsoft Word crashes all the time. I just save a lot and I just quit and reopen it. So why the computer really needs this magical protection, all right? The OS is doing some really magical stuff and the computer needs it because all the code that you and me write, they have bugs in it and they're going to break. So you're going to write your own programs and you're going to execute your new like fancy shiny program on the computer but of course it's going to have bugs and it's going to misuse resources on all, all that stuff, right? Every single software has bugs. It doesn't matter if we write it or Google writes it or Facebook writes it. Every single software has bugs in it and the operating system protects the computer from those bugs so you can't misbehave and just ruin everyone's day, all right? So, and this is all done by create all this, all the features we kind of talked about like virtual memory, scheduling, but the OS really is a little magical in this sense, all right? So this section is more of like a let's take a step back and appreciate how well the OS is managing all the hundreds of processes running on one computer at a given time. So the last section of this video, I just want to talk about some of the magic stuff that you can do, right? So you're protected, right? We just talked about how you're protected. The OS has a certain level of abstraction for all these processes, but what kind of stuff can we do as programmers to do cool things? Um, I have three things here. One is multi-threaded programming, which is cool stuff and also very hard and nuanced, has its own complexities of doing multi-threaded programming, but what are some cool use cases if you want to use multi-threaded co code, right? What if you have a lot of computation that doesn't depend on each other and it can all be done in parallel with some parallel uh, processors? You might opt to do some multi-threaded code. So if you have tons of computation to do that don't rely on each other, you could execute them on different threads and the processor could run all of them simultaneously. Uh, another good use case of multi-threaded programming is you can avoid states where you're blocking some important functionality. So one example is if, you're, if your program you wrote is writing to disk a lot, like maybe you're writing to a database often or you're writing to some big files, that can be a very slow process. So you might want to offload all the disk writing to a separate thread to free up the main one, all right? Remember that all processes have at least one main thread and maybe more. Um, so besides multi-threaded programming, you can also, you can also do multi-process programming which is also pretty crazy, but processes can create other processes. And there's this uh, well-known command, but one process, process can make and track another process, which gets pretty crazy, right? Because where does it end? It could, one, you can make one process, each one of those makes more, they make more, they make more, and that's when the system kind of breaks. So um, one good example of this is that there's many web servers. If you guys read, about, read up on how web servers work, web servers can execute many processes at the same time, and there's usually like a master one that manages other processes. So that's also a very cool thing you can do. 
Uh, last but not least, um, there's also processes that can communicate with each other. This is called interprocess communication or IPC. Um, so processes can communicate with each other even though the OS kind of puts walls and encapsulates around it. So the most basic way you can think of is a file, right? A file, you can actually use a file to do interprocess communication. Process A writes some info to a file. Process B reads the info from the file, and essentially you do have some level of communication there. So that's probably the most primitive way of interprocess communication, and there's many, many others, all right? And networked interprocess communication, this is kind of the stuff we're going to talk about next time. But when you do interprocess communication across computers on a network, that's like the backbone of the internet. All right, and this is where it gets even more crazy. So that's it for this video. Um, so just to summarize, we spend a lot of time talking about one computer, and next time we'll spend we'll spend time talking about many many computers, which is a whole different level of complexity. But uh, we have some time here, so I just want to recap what we did because it was a lot. So the whole purpose of this video was really to understand how a computer works and tie together some fundamental concepts. Um, definitely said a lot of words maybe, I don't remember everything I said, but if anything I said doesn't make sense or if any of this list of words is too unfamiliar to you, just go back, uh, watch some of my videos, maybe read a book, or just Google and search about what these things mean because there's so many different parts. There's like hundreds of different parts and it all comes together to make a computer. It's crazy, right? So remember, from the moment your computer turns on, it activates the operating system and loads it into memory, right? The operating system's job is just to schedule and execute processes and tell the CPU what to do. We talked about the hardware connection, about who tells the CPU what to do. Remember, it's always the OS. There's always that hardware connection between hardware and software, which is really important. And it's also really important to understand how the CPU does it, all right? Not all CPUs are the same, and some are just gonna be better and do things more efficiently than the other ones, so. So after we talked about the hardware connection, we talked about process, the actual operating system and processes. We talked about scheduling, why do things break, um, and we talked about this OS magical protection that's provided for all the processes. So when one fails, not everything fails. Um, and then we talked about some magical stuff you can do with one computer. And next time, we can talk about magical stuff you can do with many computers, which is like how the internet works. So I guess just to give a little bit of taste for that video is kind of like using one computer is pretty simple, but there's only so much one computer can physically do. Right? Think about Facebook or Google getting hit like millions of times a second or whatever, but there's resources, right? You can't build a computer the size of a town, but a computer has limited resources, and that's why you need many, many different computers working together to make crazy services possible. Like Facebook probably started as one computer, but now it's probably, you know, ten thousands, tens of thousands of computers in a warehouse powering that service. So that's when things start getting really crazy because you can even see how one computer is a little crazy, right? Just think about that multiplied by n computers and how they can all communicate with each other to do insane things. So yeah, it's crazy when you think about it, but at its very core, you still have to understand how one computer works. So hopefully this video shines some light on one computer. And if you really understand what's going on for one computer, you'll understand how networks of computers are working. So. Hopefully this video was helpful. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope it was enlightening in some way, and I'll see everyone next time. All right, take care.